This is Geometry Lesson 7, 7, and 7, 8, Parallelograms, Properties and Sufficient Conditions. 7, 7, and 7, 8 go together really well. One looks at properties of a parallelogram. So if you know you have a parallelogram, then you can say some certain things about it. And the other one is if you have a quadrilateral and you want to try and prove that you have that you have a that that quadrilateral is a parallelogram, then you need to look for some other some different um, characteristics. So as we start, I'm going to first look at lesson seven seven where it breaks it down into the properties. So we use the properties of a parallelogram when we know, in fact, that our figure is a parallelogram. So if it is a parallelogram, we know by definition that it has two sets of parallel sides. But if we want to look and see what other features a parallelogram has, we know that opposite sides are going to be congruent. So in your diagram and your notes, you'll want to show the markings for that. The other thing we know is that opposite angles are congruent. So we know that we have this set of angles being congruent and then this set. We know that consecutive angles are supplementary. So if I call this angle 1, 2, 3, and 4, we can say that angle measure of angle 1 plus measure of angle 2 equals 180. We can say that the measure of angle 2 plus the measure of angle 3 equals 180, and we can go on. 3 and 4 would make 180, 1 and 4 would make 180. So angles that are consecutive, meaning that they're next to each other, they share a common side, then they are supplementary. And the last property that we have a par of parallelograms is that the diagonals intersect at their midpoint. So if you put in the diagonals of your parallelogram, we can say that they bisect, or th I'm sorry, they intersect at their midpoint. So if this diagonal is intersected here, then we know this side and this side are equal, and same thing with this diagonal. So these are the properties of a parallelogram. You will work more with these properties as you progress through the lesson, and you will also look at, when you do your reading, you will uh, read the f one of the proofs for part A, and then in your, in your problem set during class, we'll look at the proofs to prove part D, C, uh, B, C, and D. There's one more example, or one more theorem in your reading that I want to talk through, and that's uh, the distance between parallel lines theorem. I think it's something, this this theorem is something that you've probably already recognized, but I'll just go through it just one time here for you. And it states the distance between two given parallel lines is constant. We've already discussed that when we talked about the actual definition of a parallel, or of parallel lines. So if you have two parallel lines, you know that if you're here to here, draw a perpendicular line, that it, say this distance is six, we know anywhere along our parallel lines, given that we drop a perpendicular line between them, that our distance will be the same, 6, all the way across, no matter how, where we check that in our parallel lines. So now let's take a look at some examples that we have here. The first one that we'll take a look at is STUV at the right is a parallelogram with ST equaling 13, SV is 8, SW is 5.5, and they want you to find the indicated lengths if possible. So what we need to do is go back to our properties of a parallelogram and make sure we remember all the different things that we can say about parallelograms. We know by definition that the, the opposite sides are parallel, but after that we have those four different parts of the properties of parallelogram theorem that we can use to answer the rest of these questions. We know that in part A of that it says opposite sides are congruent, so if we know that this would be 13 and this side would be 8. So we can go ahead and, and par do part A here, 13, and we can do two, TU as 8. So we use part A of the properties of a parallelogram. Let's take a look at US. We know that that is a diagonal, and part, 
D say the bi diagonals intersect at their midpoints. So that means that if this is an intersection of their midpoints, then this side's 5.5 5 and this side's 5.5. 5. So that means that US or SU is going to be 5.5 5 plus 5.5, 5, so that would be 11 units. And then TV, we know that's another diagonal, and we know that SU bisects it at its um, midpoint but we don't know anything more than that so and we don't see any other angle measures or anything like that so we ha we're not able to tell the length of TV so not enough when we look at number four suppose KATE says is not shown is a parallelogram with the measure of angle K equaling 3x plus 18 and the measure of angle E equaling 6x minus 27 and they want you to find out some various things before we even begin, we want to use the strategy of drawing a picture first. So we're going to go ahead and draw a picture of a parallelogram just so we can kind of put everything in perspective for us. So go ahead and draw your parallelogram and label it. And then I'm going to go ahead and put 3x plus 18 next to angle K. And next to angle E is 6x minus 27. Now, if you refer back to your properties of a parallelogram theorem, we know that part C says that consecutive angles are supplementary. So we know that K and E have to make 180 degrees. So we can use um, algebra to solve for X, which is what our first step is, and then we can find the missing pieces there. So go ahead and set up an equation for 6X minus 27 plus 3X plus 18 equals 180 because we already said those would be consecutive angles and they would be supplementary. Go ahead and solve that. Combine your like terms. Add 9 to both sides and divide by 9. So we know that x equals 21. So now if we want to find angle E, we know that 6 times 21 minus 27 is going to give us a measurement of 99 degrees. And we know a couple things. We can find T a couple of ways. We know that opposite angles are congruent, so if we find K, we know that T and K would be the same. So we could say 3 times 21 plus 18 would give us a measurement of 81 degrees. Or we know that consecutive angles are supplementary, so we could say 180 minus 99 would give me 81 also. So that's how we could look at uh, finding the measure of angle T. The last example here for number 5 is going to explore our properties of par parallelograms theorem one more time. We are told that we have a logo shown at the right. The logo is the union of a parallelogram and two squares. So we know this is a square, this is a parallelogram, and a square. And we know the measure of angle A is 63 degrees. So they want you to find the measures of the other angles in the figure. So let's take a look here to find angle B. We know A and B as part C in our properties of parallelogram theorem say that those angles are supplementary, so those have to equal 180. So if we take 180 minus 63, that would give us 117. We know that angle C is part of a square, so that's 90 degrees. And if we look at angle E, if you look at your properties of a parallelogram theorem, part B, it says opposite angles are congruent. So these are opposite angles. If A is 63, so is angle E. And the last one, part H, that's also part of the square of the logo, so we know that will be 90 degrees as well. Now the next part of the lesson talks about uh, it has some activities, and I'm going to wait to do those activities with you in class. Mr. Carlson will do those also with, with his students. So we want to move back up to the sufficient conditions for a parallelogram, which would really be part se um, from Lesson 7-8. When we start reading through the sufficient conditions for a parallelogram, you're going to notice that they seem very similar to the properties of a parallelogram. But the thing that's different in using the sufficient conditions for a parallelogram is our starting point. 
In this situation, when you want to use the sufficient conditions, you don't know that your figure is a parallelogram, which is completely different of the other um, the other side of this chart. On that side, we know the figures are pair of a parallelogram, so we're using the qualities that we know a parallelogram has. In this side, we're trying to prove that something is a parallelogram, and so there are conditions in which we can we can use to say that something would be a parallelogram. So part A says one pair of sides is both parallel and congruent. So if we mark the side of it, these would have to be congruent, so that's the marking for that, and parallel. So the same sides, parallel and congruent. Part B, just like the other side, both pairs of opposite sides are congruent. So if you can prove that you've got both pairs of opposite angles, I'm sorry, opposite sides, If you can prove that both pairs of opposite sides are congruent, then you have enough to say enough information to say that you have a parallelogram. Part C says the diagonals bisect each other. So if you can prove in a theorem that your diagonals bisect each other, so if you can say this side and this side would be congruent and these two pieces would be congruent, you have enough to say that you have a parallelogram. And the last part of the sufficient condition says both pairs of opposite angles are congruent. So if you can show that you've got two sets of opposite angles congruent, you then can say you have a parallelogram. So that's the end of it. Then the quadrilateral is a parallelogram. Now in the activities that you will do in class for uh, these sufficient conditions and the reading that you will do, the proof that's in your reading on page 428 covers part D of the sufficient conditions for, of, for a parallelogram theorem and then in your problem sets we will also cover parts A, B, and C. So to end this lesson then I want to go through some examples that we have for lesson 8. We're going to be looking at information that is given to us to determine if that is in fact enough to say that our quadrilateral is a parallelogram. So if you look at number 1, A, if a quadrilateral has two pairs of parallel sides, is that enough to say that our figure is a parallelogram? Now if you look at the sufficient conditions, there's nothing in the sufficient conditions that says if a figure has two pairs of parallel sides, it's a parallelogram. But we know from our previous lessons that by definition of a parallelogram, a figure, ha if it has two pairs of parallel sides, then we know that it is a parallelogram. So this is a yes, not from the sufficient conditions, but because of the definition. Let's take a look at part B. Both pairs of opposite sides are congruent. And if you look at your sufficient conditions, and you look for one that says pairs of opposite sides are congruent, and that's part B. So this is a yes because of part B. Part C says the diagonals are congruent. Now it talks about diagonals in sufficient conditions, but it does not say anything about the diagonals being congruent if they need to bisect each other. So this is a no, there's not enough information. Let's go to part D, the diagonals bisect each other. And that's part D of our sufficient conditions, so yes. Part D of sufficient conditions. Let's take a look at our drawings here. Um, continuing on just trying to identify whether or not these figures are in fact parallelograms. So we have a set of opposite angles being congruent and here, and let's see here, if we have 360 degrees and if these two are 224 and we subtract 68, we would get another, we'd get 68. So this has to be 68 as well. So that means we have opposite angles being congruent and we know that that is part D of our sufficient conditions. You know what, if I say this is part D, that definitely makes this not part D, doesn't it? If we talk about bi the diagonals bisecting each other, that is actually part C. Let's change that to C. Let's look at number three. We have one set of opposite angles being congruent and one set of sides. Nowhere in there does it say anything about our those two characteristics, so we're going to have to say no, that doesn't, that's not sufficient. 
Number four, it says one side is congruent and that the other set is parallel. Now in order to have um, sufficient conditions, you need the same set to be both parallel and congruent. So if they had told us that this side and this was congruent also, then we could have said yes, but right now we have to say no. Number five is a little tricky. It says that we have one set of sides that are congruent to each other, and then it gives us some 90 degree angles. But we studied earlier in the year that if we have two lines that are perpendicular to um, the same line, then those lines are in fact parallel to each other. So if we add that piece of information that we know, then we can say that those um, that is a sufficient conditions using part A, one pair of sides is both parallel and congruent. So this is a yes due to part A. This concludes Lesson 7-7 seven, seven and 7-8. Seven,